New York Times, June 22nd, 1917. Captain John O'Brien, known wherever deep sea sailors and soldiers of fortune congregate as Dynamite Johnny, died last night at Hotel America, 105 East 15th Street. Brought up in the sight of Hell's Gate, he daily associated with sailormen and wayfarers from across the seas. It is little wonder that the love of adventure was born in him. His playgrounds were the old shipyards. Dynamite Johnny became helper to his brother Peter, who ran a sailing ferry from Manhattan to Greenpoint. And during this time, he learned a crooked and treacherous channel of Hell's Gate. I was born in the old dry dock section of New York, almost on the bank of the East River, on April 20th, 1837. My parents, though, came from County Longford and Cavan. Manhattan was a cradle of shipyards. They were clustered all about. Amid such surroundings, a predisposition to life on the sea and a love of salt water and ships came naturally. Tapering spars crisscrossed the skyline and romance was in the air. The first thing I saw when I opened my eyes was a vessel and almost the next thing, the sea. Maybe I saw other things too, but none of them held my interest. Ships and the sea impressed my infantile mind as the most beautiful things in the world. And my opinion has never changed. A Captain Unafraid is Johnny's ghost-written autobiography. It was written in Cuba and New York at the close of his life. What drew Johnny to danger, I think it was born in him. In fact, the opening sentence of his book says, with an unbridled passion for the sea and the love of adventure which it engendered, it was inevitable that I should drift into filibustering. You know, when you read this book, um, Captain Unafraid, it, it's called The Strange Adventures of Dynamite Johnny O'Brien, and strange is, it's, it would almost should be called the unbelievable adventures, because it, it really reads more like a, a, a book of fiction about a raucous fantasy character that they've just made up stories that you would follow along in a series of chapters in a, in a fantasy book. All of his adventures and expeditions had some element of danger um, to be arrested, to uh, crash on the rocks, to be blown to smithereens with the dynamite in his cargo hold. I, I never thought of him as I read and learned about him as somebody who would just be riding around in the calm waters. I don't think he was afraid of the Spanish army after him or the rocks in Hell Gate or um, the, the, what the sea might do with the wind and the weather and the storms and the electricity, lightning that frizzed his hair, whatever it did. That's not what he was afraid of. And I mean, everybody definitely has fear, but what wonder what he was afraid of. Whatever it was, he didn't allow that to stop him, and he went forward anyway, with or without it. Maybe he was afraid to stay home with a wife and 10 kids. That's probably <laughs> it. <laughs> he 
died here June 20, 1917. No way, not dead. I'm going to get in trouble. Take a look. Oh, look. Yeah. Old. It was Hotel America many years ago. Yeah. Yeah. How long have you been the super? Ten years. Hmm? Ten years. Ten years. The building built 18... Press wood and that pole and things like that. You buy some car, no plastic good. car, and everything, houses. No good. They're no. building like a paper. But that time was building. That's why I asked somebody, why are you building something as a pipe will break up? I say, it's good because for economy, that way it's good. If you build something for good, after that you get nothing to do anymore, you know. Though he was born in Manhattan's congested tenements, Johnny's story really begins in a landlocked, lake-dappled county, a lake for each day of the year, but no sea. Before emigrating, Johnny's parents were friends, neighbours, and related to the parents of General Philip Sheridan. Sheridan, Johnny's first cousin, would become a leading figure in the American Civil War. The home Sheridan's family left behind still remains in Killing Care County Cabin. Both the Sheridan and O'Brien families left for America together on the same boat in 1831. Longford, or Ship Dock in Irish Gaelic, another landlocked county, is where Johnny's mother grew up. It's no wonder that Johnny was born in New York, and even that city was too small for him. As he said, he was destined to break free out of soundings and far from the worthless worries of the little hemmed-in world ashore. It's hard for me because, you know, not being a man, I can't identify with the, the inner sense that, that he would have, but I think he was a very proud man, and I think he was, he felt good about the things that he did, and, um, and I think he got, you know, again, he had that sense that he was as good as anybody or as big as any man, and, um, and he didn't, you know, he didn't tolerate bullshit, and he was very direct. Um, I mean, he played cat and mouse, of course, with all these adventures that he had, hiding and dodging and, and stuff. But I think, I think he was very self-confident. And he, I mean, he started so young to develop skills that were so crucial to what he was doing. Just growing up with ships and boats, it's like brainwashing, really. He got kind of uh, enamored of all things nautical. And, uh, and the tugboats, of course, in New York Harbor, there were a lot of them, and they were known as the Irish Navy. The tug companies were started by Irish immigrants. The Irish were really uh, in the harbor, and, uh, and he was just very good at it when he, he became a really good pilot. So you got the East River coming in here, you got the Harlem River coming in here, and you got the East River coming in here. All different tides. 
So this whole thing forms a giant whirlpool with very heavy currents and it's all rock ledges. So it tries to push you into the rock ledges. So many, many, many vessels have been sunk here uh, by the rocks. The Slocum in 1909, she went down with a, and lost a thousand people, 1,031 people. They were coming up, they were trying to run and he was on fire. He, he got out of Hellgate, came up here and he, he beached it here on Brothers Island. But the, it, it, the currents were so bad, anybody went in the water drowned. We just went from uh, five feet of water to uh, uh, 35 feet of water. So we're in the, we're in the East River now. The pilots were able to read the currents where the other guys weren't. And so they, they could have the current help them push it around. They'd catch it just right. Unexperienced people would get caught by the currents and get pushed into the rocks. The pilots would ride it a certain way and then get out of it. They, they did like surface. They, 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 they used the current to help them. But it was tremendous experience they had to be able to do that. We're going to be hitting current all the way now. And now we're, we're going to start proceeding towards Hellgate. We'll see two bridges. One bridge, and then the railroad bridge here is the start of Hellgate. Almost as soon as he could walk, Johnny was trundling around the Lower East Side of Manhattan's dry dock, offering his services to whoever would have him. He learned his trade lending a hand to the shipbuilders and sailors of his neighborhood. Johnny ran away to sea at 13 and signed on as a cook aboard a fishing sloop called the Albion. He couldn't so much as boil a pot of water, but would catch codfish when no one else could. Having received his pilot's license from a maritime college on Cherry Street, soon he was piloting whatever vessels he could get his hands on through Hellgate, where he got his first nickname, Daredevil John. When and where no one else could be trusted on that rock-filled channel, Johnny piloted his vessels. In, in Hellgate, there, there's three different tide levels. There's the East River, there's one tide level. Uh, there's the Island Sound, which is another tide level. And then there's the Harlem River, which is another tide level. So all of them hit Hellgate, that all come in Hellgate, and they're all different tides at different levels. And of course, everything is trying to be, become the same level, and it can't be. So it just, it just starts swirling, and causes these big whirlpools all over in eddy currents. And it grabs boats and tries to push him towards shore. Shore is sharp rocks. But if they needed a cargo delivered sooner, uh, they wanted to get into their competition, they would get a daredevil pilot to bring him through. You know, most pilots say, oh no, I'm only gonna go through at this tide because I know it's safe and so forth. But if they knew the currents well and everything else, they, for the bigger money, would, would take the chance and run the boat through. Donovan John would have had to come around head for that rock there, and then swing heavy to get round this way again to get, to get through there. And while he was doing that, the whirlpool was gonna to try to be pushing him back towards that rock. You have to be damn sure of yourself. You know, you really have to know it. And you have to be that positive, you know. Too many people start doubting themselves. I guess he didn't doubt himself. Most of us um, live to some extent in a state of denial that someday we're going to die and that's, I mean, I don't, I'm not yet at the point, I'm 72 years old, but I don't feel like I'm treading on the edge of <laughs> facing that. I mean, my wife's mother, on the other hand, is in her early 90s and is very close at this point. Fear? Uh, I'm a Marine, I'm not afraid of anything. Uh, and my emotions are loyalty uh, and honor to God and my country. That's what I feel. And that's it. And Aaron Goldman. <laughs> a man who's a rebel at heart. The word fear is not in his vocabulary. It doesn't exist. I mean, it's a non-existing term. If you have fear, 
If nothing, love casts out fear. So if you have a love for a cause, a love for your country, a love for your spirituality, a love for your God, it, it abolishes fear. It's like the fools rush in where the angels fear to tread. You're fools for the greater cause and the greater good. Personally, I didn't really ever sail into the unknown. People had done what I did before me. I wasn't a pioneer. And I've never really been afraid of the natural forces like uh, storms. I'm more afraid of, uh, of uh, social uh, um, occasions and stuff like that. That's the case with a lot of adventurers. They, they relish uh, um, the mountain or the crossing the ocean or getting to the North Pole or the South Pole. But um, they're not that great when it comes to uh, going to cocktail parties or giving speeches. Yeah. That's when they get butterflies in their tummy. Nowadays, I don't know if I'm fearless, I just have sort of seen enough so it doesn't really strike me, but I have been out on, in conditions that everybody else was cringing and afraid and uh, you know, we took care of it. We, you know, whatever, you take the sails down, get into harbor, drop an anchor, I mean, you, you just learn to put up with it, then you know, I, I haven't, uh, fortunately I haven't had any serious injuries or malfeasance, and I keep a clean record with the Coast Guard so I have my license to go out and do it still. My personal fears, I was, um, at age 19 I was drafted into the Army to go to Vietnam, and at that point, I said, uh, I am not going to do this. <clears throat> I actually hitchhiked out of New York. <clears throat> Rather than being arrested and sent to the boot camp and into the meat grinder over there, I then, <clears throat> with very little in my pocket, I went, lived in South America. I feared my own government, most of all. And I was very bitter and angry, I, I, and I expected to stay in exile. I was living in Brazil, having a great time, and, and then, my father called me and said, either you come back now or never come back. And I, one of the few things I regretted is I came back. <laughs> oh yes, um, I've had my own experiences with fear. Um, worked in a children's psychiatric facility for three years, uh, taking care of adolescent and children's psychiatric patients. And I was in a riot once uh, that became a full-blown Donnybrook. Staff um, basically were being assaulted by the patients. Uh, things got out of control. I was assaulted by one of the patients, had my left orbital uh, lobe fractured. My eye was smashed down into my head during the riot. And I can honestly say that um, I should have been afraid because I was nearly dying, but somehow just trying to keep my job going and helping the other staff during the riot seemed to have pulled me through it. And it wasn't until I actually got out, uh, out into a, uh, uh, an area away from where the riot was occurring that uh, someone looked at me and said, what happened to you? <laughs> you need to sit down. <laughs> and it was uh, you know, when the adrenaline rush left that I actually realized, well, um, I came pretty close to being killed by one of the kids. Brian is trying to learn to talk Hawaiian. We're in the Lower East Side in front of Dynamite Johnny's uh, boyhood home. The neighborhood has almost been in a perpetual state of transition from the early days of New York City, uh, even back before it was New York when it was New Amsterdam, right? This is where the immigrant poor would land. And so every time there was a new wave of immigration, uh, it would reflect the character of those immigrant groups. The 11th Ward of New York was once a predominantly German one. This was Johnny's childhood stomping ground, also known as Kleine Deutschland, or Bierdom, on account of the preponderance of German beer houses in the neighborhood. I'm, I'm proud to be still living on the Low East Side, do the die regardless. Uh, Alphabet City, Low East Side, now it's the East Village. No matter how you slice it, come up peanuts. You understand? <laughs> it's a good thing, man. Especially if you wake up in the morning, you got another day. All right, but um, 
I just like to sit back and watch and I see how the neighborhood changed three or four times. It's a Spanish thing saying they flip flop like chancletas. Chancletas are like sandals that that Latinos throw at you if you do them bad. Your mother's like clean these but to make a long story short, I'm proud to still be in this community and live in this community and work in this community. I work not too far from here. Yeah, I never heard of Dynamite Johnny until you guys walked by. And we're practically neighbors. I never heard of Dynamite Johnny. Never did. But I'm not surprised he was in the neighborhood. Like I said, it's an activist community from way back in the 1800s, early 1800s, I believe. There were always protests down here and always a lot of involvement in um, unionizing and, and uh, civil laws, local ordinances. Uh, yeah, this was just a flat field at one time. Now it's lush. Johnny was born and raised a stone's throw from Tompkins Square Park. He even raised his own family just three blocks from there. Tompkins Square Park is the beating heart of the Lower East Side, or at least its lungs. Like its surrounding neighborhood, it has seen its fair share of trouble and strife. In 1863, the draft riots swept across Manhattan and Tompkins Square. In 1874, riots again inflamed when 7,000 unemployed were driven from the square by mounted policemen. Not much more than 100 years later, in 1988, riots kicked off again when disenfranchised locals defending homeless in Campton the Park clashed with police. Police were armed with helmets and riot gear and many had their badges covered as they enforced the curfew in Tompkins Square Park. It turned into a pitched battle with the homeless and their supporters and innocent passers-by. Uh, even since Johnny's time, it's always been a place where people who were less fortunate or new arrivals or just couldn't fit in anywhere else fit in here. This whole area seems to have been a place where people who couldn't assimilate in any other part of the city or any other part of society felt comfortable because they created their own society. Dynamite Johnny's long and varied career was as broad as the ocean he sailed so often on, and varying images of Johnny emerge. He threw himself headlong into danger, like another man might, into the arms of a long lost love. When the Civil War kicked off, he says he was too well acquainted with himself to enlist as an able seaman straight away. He knew there would be trouble if some smart young officer undertook to order him around. A promising opportunity soon arose which he couldn't refuse. He was offered a job as a third officer aboard the Illinois, which was intended to ram the ironclad Confederate vessel, Merrimack. Shortly after, he came to captain a vessel carrying arms to the Confederate cause in Texas, through the Mexican port of Matamoros. He didn't know at the time when he signed on what it was for, but while en route, I mean, he, he found out that it was really, they were bringing this stuff to the Confederate uh, army. And he decided, oh well, you know. <laughs> I don't think it bothered him either way, uh, somehow. I, don't, I didn't get that sense that he felt like he was betraying his country or anything. I think he did it on purpose. He, <laughs> he was about 25 at the time. Involved in revolution from Haiti to Honduras and from Texas to Mexico, in many ways, Johnny was the quintessential rebel without a cause. You know, people in that frame of mind and in, that, and in war, they, they frequently find themselves in awkward situations, and he certainly did, and it wound up shaping the rest of his life. You know, when you get used to that kind of action, I would imagine that it's very difficult to come back to New York and just get an office job. And a guy like him didn't want to do that, and he didn't do that, and he had quite an interesting life. So he was, I would say, a rogue, definitely. A daredevil, an adventurer, but a good man. Johnny's story epitomizes the wonder and lust for new frontiers that characterizes the lives of so many 19th century trailblazers and adventurers. It also gives us a vision of the darker side of this lust for adventure. Daredevil John of the Lower East Side, who became Dynamite John for many years, was involved in rebellion and revolution, it seems, for the sheer hell of it. It makes sense that a rebel without a cause would find the Lower East Side to be a safe haven. The Lower East Side has always been the place uh, where 
you could flourish. People who came here were coming to survive and to thrive, were willing to uh, explore new territory. Almost by definition, uh, they were pioneers and trailblazers. It was here by the East River that Johnny first crawled and then walked around neighboring shipyards. After school, he worked in them. The river runs north through to the twists and turns of Hellgate where he could take any ship through it in any wind that blew. He knew those waters from childhood and maintained that if he was a daredevil, he was a cautious one. He certainly didn't strike me as a madman or in anything mentally sick in, a, in any sense of the word. All in all, I think he was a guy that loved the adventure and it seems to me that he fell into a lot of things in his life. Perhaps the latter part of his life, particularly when he got mixed up in the Cuba business, by that time he had sort of made it a lifestyle, it seems to me. And he had come to accept, this is me. I'm the, I'm the bomb thrower, or at least the, the dynamiter, or the dynamite carrier. He was, I guess, one of the unusual ones that, that apparently exists which I find hard to believe, being a certified coward. I, I uh, find hard to believe that someone or anyone would say that they've never been afraid. Uh, that seems almost unnatural, but I guess, hey, we're such a mixed bag of us human people that uh, I guess there are people who never felt fear. That uh, the lack of it almost strikes me as being an impossibility, but hey, if he said he was never afraid, good for him. This pub, through its different names, Thomas Cloak, and then the Green Door, and now it's the Ear Inn, has always been a, uh, a haunt for sailors. And when we were down cleaning up the bar, when we first moved, clearing it out to set up the restaurant as it is now, we found all kinds of spikes and hooks and clubs for obviously enforcement purposes. You know, they had cudgels and longshoremen hooks that could, you know, grab you, throw you in the river. And uh, on the other end, up in the attic, we found a full obstreptical surgeon's kit for women's health. So we presume this was a women's health care providing facility. Speculums, scrapers, do the whole thing back in the bad old days. Rough waterfront is now it's a bunch of condominiums, and you know, it's just. I, I guess it's an improvement, but it, you know, all of that flavor of trouble is definitely gone. Other than, you know, the modern pirates are all online, so you no no blood on the on the deck anymore. And so maybe Johnny there is sort of the last example of that kind of a character that had a long tradition and probably he was a, a proper gentleman compared to the other sea dogs and buccaneers that operated. And New York was a major trade point for all of that trouble and intrigue and slave trading and the whole nine yards of, of trouble. Those people's lives are, just don't have that kind of drama anymore. I mean, unless you think of the, the journalists going to Syria. You know, that's the kind of folly that we have nowadays, but it's not quite as much fun as being a, a good old pirate. He, did, he wasn't really a pirate, though. He was, a, he was an honest smuggler. <laughs> Father Pat Maloney has lived around the corner from Dynamite Johnny's childhood home since 1961. Once described by British Army Intelligence as the underground general of the Irish Republican Army's gun running activities, in 2012, a New York Times article entitled A Priest Unafraid of Trouble quoted Father Pat as saying, I never broke a law, but have circumvented most of them. He says mass at St. Bridget's Church, Tompkins Square, every Sunday. So irrespective of what happens, like you know in the psalm, do I walk through the valley of darkness and the shadow of death? I fear no evil, because you're with me. 
And many times the person is walking through Death Valley and there's death all around him. But he still must keep, keep on and keep going because he's pursuing a particular goal. It's a mysterious ghostly compunction to follow your beliefs. It, it can be spellbinding. Now I can tell you from quite personal experience. It's an awesome, uh, it's a power, but it's a dangerous power because if you don't control it, you could create total havoc. Over a long career, Johnny carried dynamite to many revolutions in the Americas. And it's important to realise the bloody purpose for which the dynamite and arms he so often carried were intended. O'Brien was a mariner that became a gunrunner. Later in life, he came to captain the first vessel in the Cuban Navy. He remarked to a reporter as he gestured at the Cuban flag, now I fly under my own flag. Some might consider him a criminal or worse, a terrorist. None more so than certain factions in Ireland who, having recently joined fully the ranks of Western democracy, are anxious to distance themselves from a revolutionary past. All the while, it being clear, the countries of the West have killed and coerced too, along with the downtrodden and others in the name of freedom and interests over long centuries. Yeah, I do. I have fear almost every day. I think today a lot of people live in fear and anxiety, especially living in the city. Don't you? Yeah, maybe a little bit. Sometimes but I'm fearful I don't that someone's going to beat me up or I'm going to get... I don't feel fear in, in New York. I feel up. fear in, in Helsinki. It's yeah. like... I don't know why, but I don't feel fear here. Yeah, I, I do. Because I've been held up at gunpoint here. One time a gang of guys tried to beat me up when I was walking over the Williamsburg Bridge and I had to like run away from them. So I have that always in the back of my head. And I know other people that do too. El temor es un sentimiento que congela al ser humano. Uno, por lo general, teme a lo que no conoce. Teme a lo que frente a eso no puede hacer nada. No tenga conocimiento, no tenga habilidades, actitudes. El hombre, desde que existe como especie, ha temido. Le temió al trueno, al fuego. Con el restablecimiento de las relaciones diplomáticas entre Cuba y Estados Unidos, se puede decir que en un sector de la población ese sentimiento de temor esa ansiedad de saber o de no saber qué realmente va a pasar. Las personas mayores creen, los adultos creen, que la historia va a dar un paso hacia atrás. Vamos a involucionar, vamos a ser nuevamente propiedad de, de los Estados Unidos. Los jóvenes generan otro tipo de ansiedad. Si será la mejoría, con mejores oportunidades de trabajo, mejorías económicas, y eso ha provocado precisamente eso, un ambiente de ansiedad, o sea, para ser, por saber, no sabemos qué va a pasar. Y ese temor está, está latente, hasta que, como todo temor, a medida que se vaya conociendo, el temor vaya desapareciendo. Dynamite Johnny got his name carrying 60 live tons of dynamite to Colombia through an electrical storm in 1888, the same year as the Great Storm of New York. Um, the worst electrical storm I've been in was, believe it or not, on Lake Michigan. And uh, when, when we have fall weather, the, the thunderstorms roll through there uh, at an amazing pace with very, a lot of ferocity. And uh, I was doing a delivery of a, of a beautiful yacht called an Oyster. And uh, 
uh, I was following, I was trailing a storm. It was receding in front of me and I had to get this boat delivered the next day and uh, I was trying to make good time up to, uh, up to Green Bay, Wisconsin and uh, all of a sudden at two o'clock in the morning it reversed direction and stopped receding in front of me and, and actually came back upon me. For two hours I turned around and went the other, the wrong way just to avoid uh, getting struck by lightning. Even though I knew it was a rare occurrence, I mean, it happens. Uh, I had the moonlight behind me and dark clouds in front of me. And beneath those dark clouds, lightning just rattling off the surface of the, of the water, left, right, and center. It was all around. And it was like a curtain in front of me. And uh, when I noticed it, I was gaining on it. You know, I had no choice but to turn tail and uh, go the other way. Some places you just don't want to be. Alfred Nobel, originator of the Nobel Peace Prize, also invented the fiery substance from which Johnny got his name. The early form of dynamite was very unstable. It was just basically sawdust uh, soaked with nitroglycerin and then packed into rolled paper. The dynamite under certain conditions when it's very humid and hot would begin to sweat and that sweat was literally droplets of nitroglycerin that would come off onto the dynamite and cause horrendous explosions. It wasn't until many years later, till about the turn of the century, that stabilized gunpowders were developed that would produce uh, the same bang and effect that the old dynamite had. Um, but Johnny was notorious for being one of the few captains who would actually carry dynamite on his ships. Uh, supposedly from the uh, stories and the legends, uh, he wouldn't even inform his crew that the dynamite was on board. He would like tell them it was some other kind of cargo. We're taking bananas <laughs> down to Bogota. <laughs> and in reality, he'd have a hole full of dynamite. I was faced with these sort of decisions as a single-hander, very often you'd, you'd meet people and they might offer, look, I'll come along. And it's that point you have to decide, well, is, you know, is it really safe? And in my case, I thought I'm better off uh, only being responsible for myself. But um, whether Dynamite Johnny really uh, misled the crew uh, seems, seems dubious. I'm sure they knew what they were getting into. A wealthy Cuban of revolutionary proclivities wanted to change the political map of Colombia and had bought 60 tons of dynamite to help him on his way. His next step was to get a captain crazy or calculated enough to transport the cargo. He got his name Dynamite Johnny O'Brien because a current ran through the vessel. He says that his own hair was crackling like a hickory fire uh, when he ran his hand through it. He didn't mind going down and literally tying dynamite together that was rolling around in the bottom of the boat. When it came to shipping a crew, I was forced to do some lying, which I regretted. But there seemed to be no other way out of it. If the truth were known, I couldn't have secured a crew on any terms. our cargo at the Statue of Liberty. Had our ordinance exploded at that hallowed spot, I would have been known by an altogether different name. Uh, it did not require much persuasion to induce me to take command of the expedition. There was quite enough danger about it to make it attractive, and being of Irish parentage, I was favorably disposed towards dynamite on general principles. We left New York early in the summer of 1888 and had good weather all the way down the coast. When we hit the Gulf of Mexico, our luck changed entirely. And I was about to be baptized for better or worse with the name that I would henceforth be known.
long arms of fire came at us as if they were aimed by old Jupiter himself with wholesale murder in his heart. At this moment, I shook myself and took myself down to the belly of the craft where it turned out I was none too soon in my inquiry. Dynamite was under me and around me, the ship's timbers screaming and groaning like 10,000 devils just out of hell. Crashing thunder, blazing lightning, and a deluge of water below, and the mighty rolling ocean above us. How it came to be that we sailed safely into Cologne Harbor, I do not know. When the crew saw the hundreds of boxes of dynamite coming out of the hold, they would have murdered me had they not been suffering considerably from heart failure. I offered no explanations and no apologies, but made a mental note not to ever tie myself or anyone else, for that matter, in such a bind again. Captain O'Brien returned to New York with an attack of Chagres fever that almost killed him. The fever is named after a tropical river that sleeks into the city of Cologne. Johnny recuperated from his illness near Sailor Snug Harbor. One newspaper account tells of him leaving the cottage he had rented on Staten Island with a fine head of black hair. When he returned a few months later, his skin was a trifle paler, but his hair was the color of chalk. No one knew the horrors of suffering which caused the transformation. Who knows how many explosive cargoes that strange white-haired man guided to a snug haven, the reporter said. Uh, Johnny uh, was quarantined up on City Island. When he uh, uh, was released, he was able to, I guess, fight off the yellow fever, which he uh, suffered from. Many patients did recover from yellow fever. It seems from the article that we were able to locate that he moved to Staten Island. It wasn't uncommon for seamen to purchase homes on Staten Island, uh, cottages that would allow them to escape the heat of the inner city. Uh, when they were in port and not out sailing, they would often come and live on the island during the summertime. This afforded them a nice rural place to live some peace and quiet, got them out of the hectic, uh, hot streets of the city, and allowed them to live in fairly good comfort. Uh, Sailor Snuck Harbor, it was uh, brought about by a charitable organization founded from the bequeathment of a will by a man named uh, William Randall. He was a uh, pirate and privateer during the French and Indian War and the Revolutionary War, what we would call a harbor pirate. He didn't go out on the big ship with the black flag and hunt down merchantmen, but what a harbor pirates used to do was they'd have small vessels that would pull up next to warehouses or uh, transport ships when they were in port, and they would raid the ships and steal the cargo off them. Um, during uh, the times of war, of course, with a letter of privacy, this was considered a legal act, but during regular peacetime, of course, we tend to frown upon actions like that. Johnny's own actions provoke questions as to the validity of following law just because it is the law, often to the detriment of right or common sense. It seems the law sometimes suits itself, and Johnny certainly had his own reasonings and reasons too. As he once said, any man that can't disobey an order ain't worth shucks, and more tellingly. Certainly it does not come with good grace from a country which prides itself on the principle that the will of the people is the law of the land, to say to its neighbors that it shall not oppose tyranny and fight with every means in their power for what they believe to be their rights. We Americans should not forget that we were rebels once ourselves and warmly welcomed filibustering aid from France in the time of the revolution. 
Though Johnny was involved in revolution and ruction on many's the foreign shore, it is only when he pins his sail to the mast of Cuba that he finally seems to have found his calling. Forevermore, he is intimately connected with the island republic he helped bring about. As the chapter of a captain unafraid entitled The Call of Cuba Libre begins, the summons came and was responded to in the way that distinguishes that which is preordained. Johnny once said that Cuba owes her freedom more to Jose Marti than to any other man. O'Brien's story collides with, and indeed is an integral part of, the War of Independence Marti initiated and planned from bases in New York and Florida. Though Marti died in the first skirmishes of the war, he was its guiding light and inspiration, and is considered Cuba's national hero. in the Jose Martin Memorial. This is a monument devoted to our national hero. His name is Jose Marti and he was born in the 19th century. He is the most important personality in Cuba. He was named our national hero since the very beginning of the last century. And the people named him our national hero not only because of organizing the independence war, our last independence war, but also because of his value as intellectual, a philosopher. He is one of the most important writers in the Pan American letters. And he organized our last independence war against Spain that started in 1895 and it was finished three years later. He was shot fighting in the independence. He wasn't a soldier, but maybe he thought that he should be there, you know, and he, he was still fighting his first military experience. After his death, he became the symbol of the independence, you know, the apostle of the independence of Cuba. Fue una persona que escribió de todo durante su corta trayectoria, durante su corta vida. Hizo de todo. Fue periodista, embajador, maestro, dirigente político. Y fue una persona que aportó mucho a la causa revolucionaria cubana. Gracias a Martí, quien estudió detalladamente las causas que habían conducido al fracaso en la guerra de 1868, conocida como la guerra de los 10 años, y la guerra chiquita, la causa fundamental, la falta de unidad entre los cubanos, tanto en el interior de la isla como la falta de unidad con los cubanos en el exterior. Conociendo esto, el temor de José Martí era precisamente no poder lograr, no poder llegar a todos esos cubanos que hace, trabaja intensamente da discursos políticos, crea una conciencia revolucionaria, recupera ese sentido de pertenencia del cubano que a pesar de vivir en el exterior sentía por Cuba y gracias a esto funda el Partido Revolucionario Cubano, que a lo largo de la historia cubana, valga la redundancia, se conoce como el mayor momento de unidad de nuestro proceso revolucionario. The whole country rode in behind the revolution Jose Martí had fermented over long years. Support for the necessary war came in some of its most stringent forms from some unlikely sources. For instance, cigar makers and barbers were great supporters of the War of 95. Bueno, eh, quizás eh, desde mi posición como peluquero, como barbero y la pasión que tengo con el oficio, te voy a hablar de la guerra desde los barberos, desde los peluqueros. Y en todas las guerras, especialmente en la guerra de independencia, eh, por supuesto, hubieron barberos, eh, mambices y, y, y barberos que llegaron a tener grados importantes dentro del ejército libertador. Juan Sportorno, for whom National Barber Day is named in his honor, though he didn't take part in Jose Martí's war, was president of Cuba in arms during the previous insurrection, the Ten Years' War. Hubieron varias expediciones, hubieron varias expediciones eh, 
de, de, o sea, que traían armas de, de los Estados Unidos porque los tabaqueros cubanos jugaban un papel importante, recaudaban fondos, el propio Martí andaba por los Estados Unidos en Tampa y estuvieron eh, reuniendo dinero para comprar armas para traer a Cuba. Y creo que, que también en medio de, de ese momento histórico también aparece algo que hay que destacar, que es el tema del internacionalismo en la guerra de independencia. O sea, eh, ese es un caso de ejemplo de, de muchas personas de otros países, en este caso un irlandés, que estuviera involucrado, comprometido con la propia guerra de independencia en el siglo XIX, colaborara, que, que ayudara a transportar las armas de, desde Nueva York o de otro punto de Estados Unidos. Here in the Cuban Pilots Association, a plaque pays homage to Dynamite Johnny and the contribution he made to the necessary war. O'Reilly Street in Old Havana celebrates that same internationalism that Cuba still holds dear. Two island peoples in the same sea of struggle and hope, Cuba and Ireland. The adjoining street, Calle Obispo, has this tribute to Polish immigrant Carlos Roloff, one of the most important generals of the War of 95. The Cuban war effort drew people from across the globe attracted to the good fight and the promise and attendant thrill of adventure. For Johnny's part, he said, any sort of filibustering expedition would have tempted me away from the prosaic piloting of New York, provided it offered any reasonable amount of adventure. But above and beyond my natural inclinations in that direction, my sympathies were strongly with the Cubans. So it was that Johnny took his place as the most lasting and loved of the Marines employed by the Cuban Revolutionary Party of Jose Martí. Far from Havana, in the Union of Artists and Writers of the province of Ciego de Avila, Professor Jose Quintana is writing a book about Johnny called John Dynamite, Marine Mandi. El aporte de Johnny Dynamita en esos momentos fue muy importante. Él trajo hasta donde he podido investigar 15 expediciones. Y en esas expediciones trajo a cuadros militares. Trajo al general colombiano Abelino Rosas y a decenas de coroneles, tenientes coroneles, veteranos de la guerra anterior que tenían experiencia y se pudieron incorporar a la nueva contienda gracias al valor de Johnny que los trasladó. Por otra parte, trajo a Cuba en esas expediciones miles de fusiles, de machetes, de revólveres y, otros, y otras armas, además de alimentos, medicinas. Otro aspecto del aporte de Johnny hay que verlo en, el, en que trajo internacionalistas de varios países, combatientes eh, colombianos, mexicanos, europeos, franceses, rusos, trajo combatientes rusos que desembarcaron en Pinar del Río y él trajo a varios de estos oficiales veteranos de las guerras en Europa, en América, que vinieron a Cuba, incluso norteamericanos, a transmitir esta experiencia. Este es otro aporte de Johnny Dinamita a la causa independentista de Cuba. Hay algo muy interesante y curioso. La orden para el alzamiento que envía Martí a Cuba viene envuelta en una hoja de tabaco y precisamente se escoge el 24 de febrero del señalado 1895 porque era el segundo día de carnaval, era un domingo de carnaval y entonces las personas en los campos y en las ciudades podían caminar libremente, montar a caballos y levantar sospechas para el régimen colonial. Y así se produjo el levantamiento el 24 de febrero. Aquí jugaron en esta guerra un papel fundamental. Primeramente, la contribución de los tabaqueros de Tampa y Cayo Hueso, porque centavo a centavo Martí logró que ellos financiaran las grandes expediciones que vinieron a Cuba. Dentro de esas expediciones podemos recordar con mucho cariño a los cubanos a Johnny Dinamita, que le llamamos 
precisamente aquí en Cuba, Juanito Dinamita, por la cantidad de expediciones que organizó a través del departamento de expediciones organizado por el Partido Revolucionario hacia Cuba. It was not an easy task. Uh, he had to face uh, the United States forces and he had to face the Spanish forces, uh, even spies and the fleet of both countries. So it was not easy for him to do all what he did for Cuba. That's why he will always be remembered in this country. Los españoles podían hundirlo a cañonazos y también los norteamericanos confiscarle el barco si lo capturaban en esas operaciones clandestinas hacia Cuba. Hay que destacar que Johnny fue un contrabandista en la primera etapa de su vida. Fue un rebelde sin causa. Su única causa era eh, burlar a las autoridades de los diferentes países de América Central, del Caribe, a los Estados Unidos. Cuba era, la, junto con Puerto Rico, las únicas colonias que quedaban del Imperio Español en América. Johnny no duda en dejar esa vida aventurera de contrabandista y a partir de entonces, del año 1896, Johnny O'Brien o Juanito Dinamita, como le llamaron los cubanos, fue un rebelde con causa, una sola causa, la libertad de los cubanos. But I would imagine he did have fear, but he realized that he was doing the right thing for a lot of right reasons, especially in helping the uh, Cuban rebels. Oh yeah, I understand why he would say he wasn't afraid, because it would have damaged and, and affected all the people that were with him. Uh, and he also had a reputation to protect, but I'm sure he had it in himself, deep down, because we all have. We all have that. And, and we aren't doing anything as dangerous as he did, you know, like running guns, and getting shot at, and possibly getting in prison. I think that, yes, at some point, I think uh, he uh, was afraid of something, like uh, the moment when he was in the middle of a storm with uh, 60 tons of dynamite. Uh, that might have been a moment in which I think he was a little bit afraid, <laughs> but he could deal with that. It is there because you are human, but you have to know how to deal with it. You know, as the captain of the boat, you have to be a power of example to all of your yeah, people you under you. You can't show fear. You can't show fear. So, in that regard, that's a good quality that he had because, you know, he's afraid, then everyone else is going to be afraid. And people usually pick up on other people's vibes. Like, if someone's very afraid, then they'll be afraid. Or if someone's really feeling strong, they'll be like, oh, okay, I'm going to feel strong too and not feel so afraid. Usually, the Boer War is identified as a kind of the first guerrilla war of fighting a colonial power. It's actually the Cubans uh, who take a model of anti-colonial insurgency, a popular insurgency with a populist base, with a social agenda, with, uh, with, with at least a rhetoric of, of democratic participation, social equality, racial equality. And so this amalgam, this, this what we can call the, the, the kind of, the Cuban war for independence is not simply a war of independence to free Cuba f from political rule of a colonial power. So it's an anti-colonial struggle to be sure that summoned participants on the basis of a, of a free Cuba, uh, national sovereignty, self-determination, uh, as Jose Martí said, you know, for all and the well-being of all. So, in many ways, this is this is an anti-colonial struggle that has a very specific political, economic, and social agenda. At the age of 61. Johnny forged a legacy for which he would forevermore be known. Having recently supplied guns and dynamite to General Soto in Honduras and General Hippolyte in Haiti, Johnny was back to his old job of ferrying cargo around the newly tamed Hellgate. 
The largest dynamite explosion in US history had blasted out its rocks and made the channel easy to navigate. In this tepid atmosphere, Johnny was approached by the Cuban junta, whose plans had so often been plagued and scuttled by spies and the many crooked sea captains of New York port. When they approached Johnny, the Cubans were in sore need of a savior for their floundering New York operations. Captain O'Brien, for his part, did not need to be asked twice, and his first trip to aid the Cubans was soon underway, ferrying 2,500 rifles, a 12-pounder Hotchkiss field gun, 1,200 machetes, 1,500 revolvers, 200 short carbines, 1,000 pounds of dynamite, an abundance of ammunition, and one general, Calixto Garcia, to the island. Johnny maintained the Cubans were broke and there was more money to be made piloting legal cargo from New York than ferrying armaments and men to Cuba. At any rate, his first expedition was a roaring success. That is, Garcia and his rebels were now encamped in the mountains of Old Oriente province, where, along with the guns Johnny had supplied, they vigorously engaged the Spanish forces. La lucha nuestra era la lucha también de América, era una de las últimas colonias que faltaba por independizarse, ¿no? Y su papel ha sido un papel trascendental que, bueno, apoyó considerablemente y tuvo una implicación en nuestra historia. Yo pienso que es importante que, que todo cubano conozca la historia. A mí, a mí me, impresiona, me ha impresionado muchísimo lo, las cosas que he conocido del equipo. Debemos nosotros, los historiadores cubanos, trabajar en función del conocimiento de la historia de este hombre. La guerra del 95 en Cuba fue una guerra antiimperialista, sin lugar a dudas, y estuvo conformado por una cantidad inmensa de combatientes internacionalistas. Y yo creo que eh, John es un ejemplo de que yo, llegó a interiorizar ese pensamiento de que la patria no era solo donde había nacido, de donde había salido su familia, de allá de Islandia, sino que patria era humanidad y por tanto hizo que Cuba fuera también su patria. Y yo creo que los cubanos y el mundo, ¿no? Debe reconocerlo él como, como un gran hombre por lo que hizo por la libertad de este pueblo y con ello, ¿no? De la libertad porque precisamente eh, lograr la libertad de Cuba era algo muy significativo para el futuro de los pueblos de América. También trajo una expedición en, que, en la que vino por primera vez, en una primera expedición de que vino Carlos Rolof, no en la segunda, sino en la primera. Hay una segunda expedición, Rolof Sánchez, pero la primera expedición que viene, <coughs> perdón, que viene Carlos Roloff, el polaco, bueno, pues viene esa expedición bajo el mando de Johnny Dinamita. Y él abraza esa causa. Abrazar esa causa es abrazar una causa muy justa, y yo diría una, una causa de las más justas que había en ese momento ¿no? de su vida. Y que todo lo otro que hizo, creo que lo que eh, lo hizo prepararse, ¿no? Para poder cumplir entonces con esa honrosa tarea de, de propiciar ¿no? las expediciones a Cuba. Porque sin la preparación que él tuvo en, todo lo que, en todas las guerras y en los países que él participó, no le hubieran dado la, la astucia, la inteligencia, la audacia que tenía. Our destination was the San Juan River, east of Cienfuegos. We had waited 12 miles out to sea. Once it was dark, we steamed at full speed for the river. There was a narrow channel running out from its mouth with dangerous shoals on both sides of it for 10 miles, which made it a difficult place to get into and a much more difficult one to get away from in a hurry. over starboard, I cried, climbing up on the wheel, which should have been handled by two strong men instead of one little Irish. 
we hit them right square in the middle of the deck house. As pretty a shot as Mike Walsh ever made. What follows is the libel suit filed by the US government, which led to the eventual seizure of the Three Friends. That the vessel Three Friends, to wit, December 14th, 1896, within the southern district of Florida, at the port of Fernadina, was then and there by certain persons, to wit, John O'Brien, W.T. Lewis, and others, heavily laden with rifles, cartridges, machetes, dynamite, and other munitions of war and that said vessel was furnished, fitted out, and armed to be employed in the commission of piratical aggression on the high seas, on the subjects, citizens, and property of the King of Spain. A traitorous Cuban sailor who had confided in the enemy was found out before we came ashore. I was told that no more than a few hours after we had landed back at the Florida Keys, the sailor was hacked to pieces by machete, by his companions. Besides his trials at sea, Johnny had to contend with hired detectives or Pinkerton guards who stalked out his home in Kearney, New Jersey and watched his every move on land. At one point, Mrs. O'Brien did indeed boil water and throw it out the second story window um, when the detectives were snooping around their home. Well, of course, the Pinkerton's were the most cutthroat bunch of unhung criminals she ever could get, thinking they're serving justice, where they really aren't. They're serving a distorted sense of law. I think Earl Warren said, it is in the spirit of the law, not in the letter of the law, that justice resides. The spirit of the law. They went to very elaborate uh, lengths to disguise themselves. Son Fisher wore clothing like his dad, um, and then he was sort of a decoy for Johnny so that they could get um, down to the shipyards and leave at the appointed hour. I mean, I know in my own experience, personal times of people saying, they look at you, oh, who's who? Is it this your brother, this, that one, that one? And so, well, who do you think we are? You never, you, you give a typical answer, an Irish answer. They'll ask you, uh, are you Joe, are you John, right there? Well, who do you think I am? Answer the question. You don't tell any lie, you don't give any information. Let them continue thinking. The Pinkerton Agency was not the only group looking for him. Well, and the, the Spanish government was definitely after and had, had lots of agents tracking him at all times. Nos encontramos en lo que se conoce como la trocha militar de Júcaro Morón. El objetivo de esa trocha, por supuesto, era evitar que las fuerzas eh, del Ejército Libertador eh, cruzaran al occidente. ¿Por qué? Porque el occidente era la región más rica donde estaban los mayores recursos. Los ladrillos que se fabricaban aquí mismo en, en Ciego de Ávila, pues se construía esa trocha eh, sólida que podemos decir que es una de las construcciones militares más grandes que hizo España en, en la América. Ese no tiene valor histórico, lo que es un valor didáctico, un valor educativo. Eh, el propio Martínez Campo entonces propone que venga a Cuba un, un general que tenga la fuerza, la decisión necesaria y yo diría no solo la fuerza y la decisión, sino que ya tenía un expediente de ser una gente eh, drástica, sanguinaria y que podía utilizar cualquier método para lograr reducir la revolución de los cubanos. Y entonces que él le propone que venga aquí a, como capitán general a Valeriano Huele y Nicolau. Valeriano Huele y Nicolau, una de las medidas que decide tomar es refortificar esta, la trocha. Y entonces es que a partir del año 96 comienza a construirse lo que hoy vemos. 
Whaler arrives to Cuba in 1896 as the war expands from eastern Cuba into the west. And what is known in Cuban history as the invasion of the insurgent armies from, from the strongholds of the eastern provinces into the western tip of the island. Uh, Whaler arrives to Cuba with a mandate from the Spanish government to bring an end to this uh, insurgency uh, as quickly as possible. And Whaler brings to the task a, a knowledge of, of the character of guerrilla warfare. Whaler is, in fact, the forerunner of counterinsurgent techniques that will be used all through the 20th century uh, in fighting anti-colonial insurgencies throughout the world. So Whaler comes, arrives to Cuba with a plan, as he says, to, uh, to fight war with war and understands the necessity to relocate the, the civilian population in rural Cuba out of the countryside that had been providing support, medicine, intelligence, uh, relief into what are called reconcentration camps and effectively saying anybody who is outside of these camps are now ipso facto the enemy. The Spanish government was not prepared to house, feed, nurture, care medically for these new concentration camps. So tens of thousands of people perish in these camps. As he said in, um, in one interview that he would reduce Cuba to the flatness of the palm of his hand uh, to bring this war to an end. So that anybody, including Johnny, uh, who was in any way supporting, nurturing, aiding and abetting this insurgency was, uh, was, a, was a high target of Wayla. Valeriano once declared he would hang Johnny from the flagpole of Cabana's fortress as a warning to any other would-be rebels. Un corresponsal de guerra le pregunta en La Habana a Valeriano Weyler que qué pensaba de Johnny Dinamita. Él se sentía muy molesto con Johnny Dinamita porque era el hombre, uno de los hombres que le traía expediciones que fortalecían al ejército libertador cubano. Y entonces él dice que en cualquier momento si lo captura lo va a ahorcar, lo va a ejecutar en el mástil del morro, de la fortaleza del morro en La Habana, como escarmiento para los demás revolucionarios cubanos. Y por suerte esto no lo pudo lograr porque Johnny Dinamita era un trépido, era un hombre incansable que siempre burlaba la persecución de los barcos españoles, tanto en el mar como de las tropas hispanas que custodiaban las costas donde él llevaba el desembarco de los hombres, de las armas y de las municiones para el ejército libertador cubano. Es un episodio que vincula a Valeriano Weyler, el cruel capitán general, con el revolucionario Johnny Dinamita. The same journalist who interviewed Weyler on a later date hands a letter of response from Johnny. In it, Captain O'Brien showers contempt on the infamous general, saying, he will make a landing within plain sight of Havana on his next trip to Cuba. Johnny also says if he happens to capture the Captain General of the Spanish, he will feed him to the fires of the Dauntless. Although this never occurred, a few short months later, in May 1897, Johnny landed the Dauntless and a large cargo of munitions within three miles of the presidential palace, where Valeriano was sometime ensconced. At the cusp of victory, the Cuban struggle for freedom was overtaken by U.S. interests. On the 15th of February, 1898, the USS Maine exploded in Havana Harbor, killing 260 Marines. Though Johnny always maintained the explosion was accidental, the U.S. authorities were convinced the Spanish were the perpetrators. So began, whether by design or by accident, direct U.S. military intervention in Cuba. The U.S. had been on a long road of expansionism in the Americas that began in the dry west and continued in the push to the Pacific and south into Mexican territories. The last station on this long road was the War of 98. What Roosevelt was told was a splendid little war, was indeed a conflict that made an empire of the great Republic of the West, an empire that even in our own day, the United States of America is wholly committed to protecting. sorts of images and metaphors are deployed 
to characterize Cuba's future. One is called uh, the ripe apple thesis, that Cuba, like an apple that's ripe, has no choice but to fall to earth because of, uh, of gravity, that at some indeterminate point in the future, uh, the ripe apple will, will fall and Cuba, being the ripe apple, will be incorporated into the U.S. Then this leads to what is called the law of political gravitation, which is a spin-off of this, that, that, that Cuba is too small, too weak, um, uh, to stand on its own and therefore has to be pulled in by the gravitational orbit of the United States. Al pasar el tiempo, se han hecho estudios y todo parece indicar que fue una explosión técnica, fue un accidente. Y en ese momento los norteamericanos aprovechan ese incidente, ese hecho para declararle la guerra a España y enviar a sus tropas, a su ejército para participar en el conflicto de los cubanos contra los españoles y así comienza la guerra hispano-cubana norteamericana que finalmente eh, se logra la derrota de, del ejército español pero los cubanos no logran la independencia porque el país se convierte en una neocolonia de los Estados Unidos hasta el año 1959 cuando el primero de enero triunfa la revolución dirigida por Fidel Castro. The Spanish-American War inadvertently ended Johnny's long career of filibustering. He found himself settling down at the age of 61. Perhaps he was tired of revolution and ruction, or maybe there was no more rebellion to be had. The US Eagle had now spread its wings firmly over the Americas, and Johnny would be hard pressed to find a theater in which to play the game of war without playing by the rules. And playing by the rules was something he was loath to do. After the war reached its conclusion, Johnny took the position of Chief Havana Harbor pilot, which was offered him by the first president of Cuba, Thomas Estrada Palma. A law was passed subsequently, which made it compulsory for Cuban pilots to be Cuban citizens. Johnny was on the point of resigning, as he would not renounce his American citizenship, but the Cubans waived the rule for him, and he continued the job with his pride restored and his patriotism intact. Years later, after the war, they raised the main up from Havana Harbor to have it towed out to sea, so I guess it wouldn't obstruct other things in the harbor. And they asked Johnny to guide it out there. Captain Dynamite Johnny O'Brien, at 75 years of age, put on his best morning suit, a starched white shirt and bow tie, and climbed into the rusted and patched deck. He hung an American flag from a temporary mast. And when the ships reached the three-mile limit, O'Brien's crew came aboard the main and opened the valves in the bulkheads to let the water rush in as sailors on nearby ships blew mournful taps into the air. Before he left, Captain O'Brien took the edge of the flag in his hand and kissed it. As the main slipped beneath the sea, the 30,000 people marching in the St. Patrick's Day Parade in New York paused and all the church bells tolled for five minutes in a tribute to the heroes who'd gone down with the ship. I'm sure he was 
quite sincere. And the old saying, there's no atheist in a foxhole in war or in a storm at sea. So people get quite terrified. And then if they can handle it, they often come back with a, a faith in the Almighty that might have saved them. Now, I'm, I'm a agnostic and a, I call a humanist uh, spiritualist. I don't talk about God, but I think that there are powers out there that made all this and if not personally take care of us or we need to talk to. Particularly in the old days, a lot of sailors were very religious uh, between their other indulgences. <laughs> So that kind of fearlessness and also faith in God was the, what took them through all kinds of hell and high water, especially out in the world where they were unwelcome or fighting or... And I've been in some terrifying situations, been shipwrecked and marooned and I've never had to deal with pirates other than the corporate pirates that are my employers. Bloody lot, them bastards. Oh, yes sir, yes sir. <laughs> so the, the fear of the sea is uh, sort of deep in humanity. I mean, most people go out on a boat for the first time and they are definitely uh, impressed that they're no longer uh, in a place where they can actually live. I mean, we're terrestrial beings, so. O'Brien there, it sounds like he was a real bully sailor. He wanted to go out there, do more, see more, be involved with the places he wanted to be. He obviously was very passionate about things. So that's also very different. Now you have a lot of people working, listen, the commercial shipping who wouldn't, can't care a wick about nothing anywhere. And they're just doing their job, getting their pay, go home. That will to go out there is something that a lot of people don't have or they express it in a different way in their cultural life or in their love life or in their, I don't know, you know a lot of people have adventures but it's not out, out in the middle of the, uh, the deep out there. And that's fine. Everybody gets to do what they want to do, hopefully. I'm not a very religious person, really. But I do have distinct memories being a kid. And I, I wasn't raised with religion either. My, my, none of my parents were religious. I remember when I was a kid, you know, in, in a pretty severe storm, getting, you know, you're in the boat, and the whole boat's going over these waves, right? And I'm in the forward cabin, and I remember, you know, just trying to hunker down and take a nap, and you're actually getting, I'm getting elevated and lifted off my bunk on every wave, right? Like floating, almost. And it's, you can't sleep in that condition. And I distinctly remember, without any... Uh, background whatsoever, religious background whatsoever, praying to God that please let us just make it through this one storm and I'll be good for the rest of my life. So uh, even though I'm not a man of the book, uh, maybe there's God out there somewhere saving sailors, <laughs> I hope. The American Indians uh, were, were here before us, and from what I understand, further back, somebody told me um, the Moors were here before the Indians, so I don't know. Were the Moors around before the American Indians? That's what I heard from a couple of Jamaican dudes. I'd never heard that, and I haven't researched it yet, but I found that it to be interesting. But you would think in this day and age, in the 20th century, we would stop all this nonsense already of trying to pilfer land from anybody. I mean, there must be better ways of working together than that. That doesn't work. It's just, it's just very destructive. I don't want the whole world to be the same. I don't want everybody to wear Levi's, you know? I don't want uh, everybody to have the same haircuts or the same beliefs. I like a little friction. It's good for the soul. Keeps you 
with a purpose. It's one way to do it, anyway. Life, I mean. Talk about two ship breaks, sailors. One of them used to be my friend. The others from a story by Garcia Marquez. A book I read in college just to impress. A girlfriend who thought I was well read. Cause I told her all the truth about the fiction in my head. When we think of Johnny's life, we can only guess at his motives. Was he really fearless? Did he serve the cause of Cuba because of some misguided addiction to danger? Or was he a true internationalist? When trying to get a proper picture of the man, we have to remember, Johnny, more than anything, was a sailor and a captain. His relationship with the sea is the most intangible but essential part of him. Early in life, Johnny learned, wherever danger was to be found, that was where he could truly test his mettle as a mariner. As the first chapter of A Captain Unafraid attests, Johnny was drawn inexorably to the lure of troubled waters. As the 20th century rolled in and on, Johnny declared filibustering to be in the dumps. In 1904, he moves to Cuba. He makes sporadic trips back to New York, where he is often interviewed by the press who get his take on war, old age, and infamy. Any man that can't disobey an order ain't worth shucks. It seems the trouble he had courted so diligently had turned up right at his door. My crew were, were fellas as tough as pine nuts and fuller of fight than wild cats. Johnny was a very proud character and very much in control of himself and even to, to the end of his life, of his very long life. If he lived to be 80 years old in those days, it was quite a bit of longevity there. But he, he says, and so, this is at the close of the Captain Unafraid, he said, and so I am still a pilot piloting at Havana is as simple as transporting in New York Harbor at Slackwater, and I like the Cuban climate. I have no regrets and cherish no disappointments. If I have not acquired a great deal of money, I have accumulated that greater treasure, a fund of satisfactory memories. I have done the things which came to my hand in the best way I knew how, and that, after all, is ambition's best fulfillment. He was true to his calling, and he had no, no regrets, not a lot of money, but a, a treasure of um, satisfied memories. He was um, true to himself. Johnny became a Freemason at the age of 30. He was kicked out 20 years later for not paying his dues. His relationship with money seems to have been as devil may care as the rest of his life. According to Johnny's relations, a few months before his death, he burnt all his money in the fireplace of his home on Highland Avenue, Kearney, New Jersey, leaving not even a dollar for a gravestone. In his last years, we get a picture of a man ill at ease with settling down. The filibustering had passed him by, and then he took pretty much a government job. Yet a lot of the Irish, they became assimilated into the culture, and then they got good paying jobs, steady jobs with the city. Um, it's a dream of many even to this day. And that's what he did at the end of his filibustering. He took a government job with the Cuban government, doing what he loved. Um, not filibustering, but he was still piloting ships. He was involved in seafaring activities. And then he came back home to take a, one last look at the, uh, the place where he grew up. That's a very human trait, and I'm not surprised he did that at all. And the fact that he wandered when he was here in New York, that's, that, that is an embodiment of his entire life. He was a restless soul. According to his New York Times obituary, Johnny traveled home from Cuba 
to see snow fall in New York's harbor once more before he died. Johnny returns to the US in the winter of 1916. Despite being confined to a wheelchair, he moves from hotel to hotel over a short few months. First he stays at the Martinique, then the McAlpin, a wanderer who no more can roam. Um, his Cuban friends never forgot what he'd done for them and every year threw him a big birthday party in New York. Um, a big banquet in, in appreciation of his aid to the Cuban people in the dark days of the insurrection. The Cubans organize a celebration for his 80th birthday in April 1917. At this stage, he is settled into a little known hotel frequented by Cubans near Union Square. Johnny died at Hotel America, 105 East 15th Street, on the morning of the 20th of June, 1917. When he died, the Spanish-American war veterans in Savannah, Georgia, a whole bunch of them came up to New York for his funeral. So he knew uh, a lot of people up and down the coast who really admired and respected him. So, so they were at his funeral too, along with the Masons and uh, the Cubans, who really loved him. His close friend, Victor Barranco, was by his side. Johnny's last words were, bury me by the sea, Victor. Dynamite Johnny was buried according to his wishes at Sailor Cemetery in Pelham Bay. His simple gravestone looks out onto the waters he sailed so often on. Once asked if he ever feared death, he replied, I never feared that imminent deadly breach. He passed over that breach in the month of June as the scorching New York summer rolled in. Over there by the East River where the seagulls cry and stretch their wings Shipyard boats so primed for leaving It's a long time since Johnny went a-fighting In the month of April 1837 Johnny's mother, her exhausted side Held in her arms her newborn baby Johnny Dynamite O'Brien as a restless child, he prowled the dark, seeking trouble or fortune, whichever he could find. Soon learned his trade on Cherry Street, on ships, Jane and Albion, his trade he plied. Marine and Mommy, Johnny Dunhamite. Marine and Mommy, Johnny Dunhamite. Marine and Mommy, Johnny Dunhamite. 